We're going to talk about work aim again. This is our third time. Here we are. Here we are. What's our condition? We don't remember ourselves. That's our condition. We've worked at this for years. We don't remember ourselves. We're not conscious, but we're more conscious. <laughs> That's really questionable. <laughs> it depends. You know, you, you, if I say you're more conscious, you go, well, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe. You know, I could be. Maybe. I'm conscious enough to know I'm not so conscious. So yes, in that sense. We're drunk with our own imagination in the bar of life. We're all lounging around in the bar of life, drunk with our own imagination. Imagining that we're conscious, imagining that we're awake, imagining that we can do, imagining that we are something that we are not. We're filled. We're drunk. We are drunk. We are absolutely, completely inebriated out of reality with our imagination. This is the fact. This is our condition. Here we are. We're many. We're not one. We'd like to be one. But we couldn't figure out which one we'd like to be. Which, which one? Which one do you want to be? I want to be that one. Oh, no, I think I want to be this one. And that's exactly where we are. I want to be this one right now. But in two seconds, I want to be some other one. And then in nine seconds, I am some other one, and I want to be the one I was. Well, how did I get to be this one? I don't want to be this one. Well, we're just totally dragged around by all of these eyes. We identify with each one of them in turn. We say I as if it meant something. Oh, I'm going to do this. This is comical. And especially it's comical because we believe it. Our imagination is so powerful that we actually believe what we imagine. I mean, it's, it's incredible to me. I hear people say things and I, I just kind of smile inside and I think, because you don't want to smile outside because you could get hurt. You smile outside when people are being serious about the same, when they're saying I and they really mean it, they think they mean it, they think it means something. If you say something contrary to that, they get very annoyed. They get very negative very fast. And the more accustomed they are to being negative and the more they love negative emotions, the more unpredictable and violent they can be in their negativity. So it's better to keep some of that stuff to yourself. In fact, I find that it's better to keep most of it to myself. We're full of inner accounts, internal considering. We lie. We spend our force in self-justifying, pretending to be what we're not, full of pictures that have nothing to do with our real selves. And yet we're polishing the pictures and putting new frames on them and hanging them in different spots and prominent places in our house, in our inner house. Here we are. Here we are. This is where we are. This is our state. Now, most people don't know that they're there. Ignorance is bliss. Except that if you look at the world and the suffering in the world, you see there's not a whole lot of bliss involved with their ignorance. As a matter of fact, ignorance is really misery. It's misery multiplied. And the horrible thing about the misery is there's no way out of that misery. That is useless, unnecessary suffering. It's not going to go anywhere. The suffering that you encounter in this work will bring you out of useless, unnecessary suffering. You will have to pay. You will have to pay your pound of flesh, as it were, to get out of your misery. You will pay, but you will get out. Whereas before you came to this work, you paid all the time, but you never got out. It was a constant cycle, highs and lows, suffering, happiness, suffering, happiness, just this wheel that continued to turn. So here we are. We react to attitudes. We speak, not from ourselves, but from acquired opinions. Well, who said that? Well, my father, my mother, teacher in school, the guy who lived down the street, my grandfather, this kid I knew in high school, this girl I knew in grade school. That's where I heard that. And we gathered our opinions. We acquired these things. We acquired these attitudes and opinions and this knowledge, supposed knowledge, from these people. And that's who we are. Connie was talking to me yesterday about a woman whose son had died. But her son was 35 years old. And he was killed in an accident unexpectedly. The woman was crushed by it. She was really set back by this because she wasn't prepared. See, people aren't prepared for death because we live in our imagination. We imagine we're not going to die. We imagine, oh, that's all going to happen some other time to someone else. We don't imagine that people close to us who are younger than us are going to die. It's a shock to us. And it's good to have a shock. It's just that we need to know what to do with those shocks. And this woman didn't really know what to do with the shocks. And Connie was talking to her. I guess Connie shared her philosophy about death and dying and what happens to people. And the woman basically, you know, he's gone. Connie said, well, he's not gone. You said he's gone. But he lived in you. He lives in all these people whose lives he's touched. And, you know, in a very real sense, what she was saying is true. Because all of the people in your life that you acquired your opinions from are living in you now. And it's indiscriminate. You had no choice about what was good, what was bad. Whatever I selected it at the time, thought, oh, well, you admired this person because he could beat the tar out of that person. 
Think about it. You admired this person because she could really slay people with her words. I mean, she could annihilate people with her words. And you admired those things. And those things then became benchmarks for you. Well, I wish I could be like that. Well, then you developed eyes in you that were like that. And now you're stuck with them. So here we are. Imagination seeps into everything we do, feel, and say. We're creatures of mental, emotional, and physical habit. How long does it take to break a habit? And try to quit smoking. Try to quit drinking. Try to quit overeating. Try to make the habit of meditating twice a day for a specific time, at a generally about the same time. And you realize that you are not in control of yourself, that you cannot do what you say you want to do, that you cannot do. But we have imagination that tells us, well, I can do, I can do, and it fights with us all the time, it fights with the reality of our being all the time. Well, here we are. Well, I'm not here. I'm in Philadelphia. We don't see and attack our own ignorance, and we don't take in new impressions about anything. All the impressions that we take in are all the same old impressions we've been taking in forever. Impression, what do we do? We run it through old associations, we take in the same oppression. But in order to change, we need new impressions. In order for something to be different in us, we need something different to happen. We're governed by vanity and pride, self-complacency. We're so hypnotized that we follow every event in life, making no stand against it. We think that we have to do the things that we have supposedly decided to do in life. This is so comical to me. It's like we decide, well, I'm going to do this. And then something comes up and we don't do it. Steve was going to go somewhere yesterday, but something came up and he didn't do it. And this was really important for him to do this. Really important until the something came up. When something came up, all of its importance was suddenly just gone. So where was the real importance of it? It was all imagination. There was no real importance. It was all imagination. And yet, had I told him that then, he'd have been very upset with me. Because once we have imagined something, we think it's real. And someone tries to take that away from us, we get very annoyed by that. And we'll fight to keep it. So I don't say anything. Until after the fact. After the fact, I say, well, that was this. And then, and that's what you need to do. You need to look back at it and say, he's right. As much as I hate to say it, that was imagination. It was an aim. He actually had an aim and he had connected it with the work. Well, I'm going to do this. And I thought, it just didn't sink with me inside. And I thought, okay, well, you know, what do I know? And I can tell it wasn't a work aim because it never happened. It was not a real aim, so it never happened. And so we can look back and we can see so many of the things that we really were convinced about were just pipe dreams, imagination, balloon juice, hot air, for those of you who need a translation on balloon juice. So we don't see our own ignorance because we don't see it, we don't attack it, but we are ignorant. We're ignorant of our motivation. We're ignorant of our aim. We're ignorant of what we're actually doing. We don't know where we are, but here we are. And this is our condition. But it's like, well, okay, you can stop telling us that now. Now tell us the good stuff. This is the good stuff, people. This is the stuff that will help to rivet you to where you are, to open your eyes to where you are. Because you're not moving until you open your eyes to where you are. Until you begin to see who you are, what you are, what you have become, what this life has made of you, what you actually are, not the nice pictures you have of yourself, but until you can actually see that, you're not going to have the valuation of this work to start to do the hard things that need to be done. And one of those hard things is to face yourself. Man, know thyself. I don't want to. I don't want to know myself. It's too ugly. If you want to change, you must face the ugly. Welcome to here. This is where we can start. You can't start from any place else. You can't start from some lovely idea about yourself. You can't start from, you have the divine light in you. There's a spark of divinity in you, and all you have to do is reach down there and grab it, and it will take over your life and lead you to the highest stars. That's all crap. How I know it's crap is 72 hours after you go to the seminar, you forgot it all, and you're back in your crappy life again. It doesn't work. Or you've got to go to a seminar every 72 hours. That's great. I'm addicted now. I'm a seminar junkie. Have you ever met them? Have you met seminar junkies? Have you been one? Jess? Yeah. Jess over there shaking his head. What do you mean, been one? I am one now. I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, we're junkies. Here we are. We have to get together. We have to meditate. Why? Because this is no place to stop our transformation. This is no place to stop. I can't stop here. I've got to keep moving. Why? This is not that great. Well, it's a lot better than that where I was. But I can see now what needs to happen. I can see that there are things that need to change in me. And the changes just won't happen because I can see that they need to. I see also that there's a lot of effort involved. And it's a lot of detailed effort where you need the right knowledge in order to do it. It's like popping the hood on your new car. 
taking a look under the hood and going, what the heck have they done? How do you, how do you fix that? What happens if it doesn't start? Uh, you call the automobile club, call somebody. We don't know what to do anymore. But that's not always the way it was for a lot of us. For a lot of us, it was, it was a matter of, oh, yeah, I, well, this is connected to that, and we knew something. Now I look under the hood of my car, and I think, oh, my God, I have a hard time finding the dipstick to check the oil. So here we are. But the problem is we can't start from here where we are because if we do, we'll begin to add where we are to the work. So we start to see where we are, who we are, what we are, but then we begin to add the work to this mess. It's like your house. Here's your house. This is where you live. This is your address. Here we are. Now we're going to put in new carpeting. Great. We just bring it in and put it right over the old carpeting. We don't vacuum. We don't move things. We just put it right over. There's lumps in it. And what's that? Oh, there was a chair there. A chair? You carpeted over the chair? Well, were you supposed to do something else? Yeah, you're supposed to move it. Well, nobody told me. You have to have right knowledge. You can't just re-carpet. You can't just repaint. You've got to do something else first to prepare, or else you're just adding the work to this big mess you've already got. Here we are. We find ourselves in this mess. Now we can't just add the work to the mess because it will spoil the work and it won't change the mess. We've got to get down deeper and realize that we can't do. We've got to realize how ignorant we are, how much we say that has absolutely no meaning. We just jabber, blah, 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 blah. Don't do what I did this morning. Don't sit after everybody else gets up and goes away. After meditating, don't sit and continue to meditate. It's an ugly thing, what you hear. It's just ugly. It's just stupid. You know, people just go and start to squander energy. Just blah, 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 blah. Nothing that's important, just mechanical talking. Don't do that. Because if you do that, then you're going to start to realize, oh, mom, maybe I do that. And then if you start to see that maybe you do that, then you start to look. And then if you start to look, you're going to find that you actually do that. Well, when you find you actually do that, it's like, oh, no, another nail in my coffin. How many does it take? A lot. It takes a lot of nails in our coffin to keep us down. We react to things and think that we're actually conscious. This is so incredible. We react to things and we think we're being conscious. But we're really, truly reacting. And we just can't see it. We just don't know how to see it because we're so full of imagination. All of this leads us to the realization of our mechanicalness, to the realization that we don't exist except as puppets jerked by strings. Well, that's not a very nice thing to say. I'm not a very nice person, and I don't have to be. I don't have a lot of pictures about what a nice person I've always been my whole life. In fact, I don't think I have any pictures of what a nice person I've been my whole life. On the contrary, I have a lot of pictures about what a not nice person I am. So the problem I would have with seeing myself would be to see myself as a nice person, whereas other people might have a problem seeing themselves as a not nice person. I don't have that problem. I'd like to be a nice person. I have that problem. I'd like to be nice. But the cost is too high. If I have to give up the truth to be nice, you get this instead. And then you get something like, well, learn how to deal with it. If you want what I've got, learn how to deal with the packaging. This is the packaging. This is it. And if you want it, you're going to have to deal with the packaging. If you don't want it, fine. You have no problem. Erase me from your life. It's possible. When such a puppet makes an aim, it's only to become a greater puppet. See, that's the thing about us. Our question this morning really was a greater puppet question. I didn't want to say that because I wouldn't want the puppet that asked the question to feel like a puppet without knowing that we're all puppets, without the tea up, without this whole thing. But I've not been able to find essence with the same clarity as false personality. That's a puppet question. See, that's the kind of a question is, how can I be a better puppet? And I have the answer, because you have to become a better puppet first. Before you can be a real boy, Pinocchio, you've got to be a better puppet first. And that's really the story of Pinocchio, isn't it? I mean, he couldn't be a real boy until he started to be a better puppet. Well, that's the truth about us, too. You can't make it to real man, to being a real man, a real human being, what you were meant to be, the possibility of man, until you learn how to become a better puppet. And if you try to make aim, it's only to become a greater puppet. <laughs> And that's mere puppetry. You have a choice. You can live your life in mere puppetry, or you can start to have a real life. You're here because you're getting tired of puppetry, and you want a real life. You sense there is something more. You may not know exactly what it is, but you sense it. You can smell it. You can taste it. You can, you can feel it like the hairs rising on the back of your neck when you walk into a new room or a new place somewhere, and all of a sudden you just get that feeling, that sensey feeling. 
The puppet thinks he knows how to make an aim. But standing over this puppet, the work tells us which kind of aim to make. And be sure of one thing. When the work tells us which kind of aim to make, it's always against the puppet. And that's why this work is such a rub. Because it's always working against the puppet, and I am the puppet. I'm totally identified with puppetry. I'm totally identified with all this by all of the strings that are jerking me around, whether I like it or not. All real aim is psychological. We live in a psychological world of thoughts, feelings, and desires. Yes, we also live in a world of things and computers and cars and this and that. But all of those things are strings that touch our psychological world and, like a puppet master, are jerking those strings and jerking thoughts out of us and jerking desires out of us and jerking emotions out of us. We're not responding to things. We are reacting to things. You come out and your car is gone or the wheels are gone off your car. You don't have a choice about how you're going to respond. You react. <laughs> how did they do this? <laughs> Whose fault is this? You look for somebody to blame. You look for somebody to fix it. You look for somebody to make it stop, make it go away. You don't want, it can't be my car. This couldn't be happening to me. Why is life so cruel? All of that stuff is reactions. And those are the reactions that this jerking of the strings of life are drawing out of us. The work teaches, at first, getting this psychological world in order. If you're full of hate towards someone, can you get your inner world right? No, oh, you've got to get rid of that first. Why? It doesn't work. But why can't I have my hate need it too? Well, because it doesn't work. That's why. It's just not the way this world is. When your psychological world is rightly adjusted, it transmits higher centers. We can conceal psychological thoughts and feelings in life. You can sit here right now and have thoughts and feelings inside of yourself, and you can conceal them from most of the people here. But you can't conceal them from the work because it's psychological, because it's inner because it is privy to your inner world. Well, how can it be? Well, we talked about that last week, about it being a living organism, something that comes from the conscious circle of humanity. It's mystical in a sense. You don't have to look at it that way if you don't want to. Real aim, work aim, has to do with the psychological world, how we handle ourselves and others in it. How do I handle other people in my psychological world? Well, a lot differently than I handle them out here, I can guarantee you that. Is that the truth for you? You handle people differently in your psychological world than you handle them out here? Yes, in your psychological world, you can be very abusive. Out here, you're nice, because it doesn't pay to be abusive in this situation. And then there are people that in here you love psychologically, but then out here you abuse them. What's that about? I'll tell you what it's about. We're nuts. That's what it's about. We're out of control crazy. We need new associations, a new pattern. And the work makes a new pattern in our brain. It really does alter our brain, the patterns in our brain. It makes different neural paths. You say, well, can you verify that? Yes, it can be verified. All this can be verified. Do I have the machinery to verify it? No, not outside of myself. I have to do all of my verification in my own internal laboratory. But can I actually verify it? Yes. It's called biofeedback. You can determine your brain waves by certain sensations that those brain waves induce in your body, or else they could never hook up an EEG. They hook up like EEG electrodes to your head, and they measure your brain waves. Back in the 70s, it was a big popular thing that you go to biofeedback centers. They had biofeedback centers in different places all over, and you'd go and they'd hook you up and you'd sit down and then you would practice getting your brain waves to be different by doing these relaxation techniques and these breathing exercises and things like that, they would actually change your brain waves. And by doing that, and they'd have a buzzer or a light or something that when you were on the wrong side, when you were on the right side, it was different. And so you started, and I don't mean left side and right side of your brain. I'm not talking about the hemispheres. I'm talking about the side of the brain wave scale that you want to be on. And then the big thing was the alpha state, and then the, the delta state, and then the theta state. You know, and it was like this stair-stepping deeper and deeper into these different brain waves. And then they took all these people who meditated, and they measured their brain waves, and they came up with all kinds of ideas about how to do this the quick, easy, dirty way. You know, well, all you have to do is, we found that these sounds will make these brain waves happen. Well, that's great. Good. I'm glad. But the same thing is biofeedback for me. You still got to be able to... Do it without the sounds, do it yourself, be in control yourself, and you still got to be able to live there. Not enough just to be able to get there when you listen to the sounds, you've got to be able to live there. Can you live there without those sounds? Well, why should, well, I don't, well, we can't live there with all the techniques we have now because our brains are not ready for it because we need new patterns. 
And the work will make these new patterns, these new associations. Unless you think about the work, what it means, see esotericism and its aim. Understand that man is a self-developing organism who can only develop with new thoughts and new patterns that are made in the brain, the part of the brain that we don't use. And how much of our brains do we use? About 10%. And so 90% of our brains, it's not being used. Now, what is that? We talk about higher centers. What part of the brain do you suppose gets in contact with higher centers? Do you suppose it's the 10% we're using now? No. Do you suppose it might be some of the 90% that we're not using? That would be an interesting theory. That part which can connect with higher centers. If your aim is right, this will all happen gradually, which again is part of the answer to, well, what about essence? But that will all happen gradually. You just take care of keeping your aim right now. You just take care of putting your foot here now. You just take care of putting your other foot here now. You just take care of watching where you're going and walking the way you're supposed to be walking. You take care of the training process that the work is doing in you right now. All that stuff will gradually occur. It will. Why? It has to. Real aim nourishes your understanding of the work. A purely life aim does not. You can include a life aim and a work aim and make new associations and get a new feeling of yourself. But it's not that easy. Because we're so full of imagination, the life aim starts to weigh more than the work aim. And the next thing you know, that lovely work aim that was mixed with the life aim is now on a descending octave, and the life aim is an ascending octave, and it's taking over. If you can die to old associations, you can become different psychologically. But dying to old associations isn't that easy. Because it's what we are. We're so identified with all of our old associations that dying to old associations means death. And there are not a lot of us embracing death, just in case you hadn't noticed. Not a lot of us, we look like we're running toward it, and we are running toward it, but it's not because we know that's what we're doing. It's because of our ignorance. Higher centers are always trying to change us. To higher centers, we're self-developing organisms. All they want to do is develop us. So they're trying, they're urging us, they're trying to develop us. Yet we are so embedded in all these old associations, in all these reactions to life, to the events of life, we can't get ourselves free in order to hear and come under the influence of the higher centers. The object of the work is to put us in touch with these higher centers. We think we can develop ourselves, and we do, from our own ideas. Now, we'll take the work ideas, but they, we, we make them ours. We say, well, this is good. Or we'll take the ideas of Vipassana meditation the technique. We'll say, well, that's good, but I think I'll add this. Or I think maybe I'll, I don't really need to do it that often. I don't really need to, I think I can, I'm doing pretty good. I think now's a good time to just stop. Well, I know that I'm supposed to be meditating for an hour twice a day, but, but you know, that, that second one doesn't always happen the way I expect it to happen. So I found that meditating for an hour just once a day works fine for me. I feel pretty much the same. Well, 45 minutes worked pretty good. I still feel pretty much the same. Well, half an hour, that's, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Well, you know, I didn't meditate last week, and I'm, I'm doing okay. So we think we can develop ourselves from our own ideas of what development means, what higher centers would do if we were in touch with them. That's always a good one. <laughs> well, if I was in touch with a higher center, I'm pretty sure this is what it would do. This is what it would want. And then we were into imagination again. We think we can do it. We start with a work game because it's given by conscious circle of humanity. Why we try and submit ourselves to work games is because they come from outside of life. But all the stuff that we're making up comes from inside of life because what we are is acquired in life. And until we can get in touch with something that was not acquired in life, how can we trust it? Can you really, really trust yourself? If you can, then why can't you keep a diet? Then why can't you quit smoking? Then why can't you quit doing all of the things that you don't want to do? If you can really trust yourself, then why can't you do any of those things? Because you can't really trust yourself. Well, who else are you going to trust? Now, there's a scary thought. Well, I suppose you want me to trust you. No, I don't want you to trust me. Not at all. I want you to trust this work. But I don't want you to trust it blindly. I want you to trust it in the same way you would trust a path that you were walking. You take a stick, perhaps, and poke it first and make sure it's not quicksand there. Make sure there's not a pit there. Make sure that it's really what it appears to be. Poke it. Push it. Put weight on it. Then put your foot on it. Hold on to something else and test it. And when you're sure, then try it. And then take your next step the same way. I don't have a problem with that. Take your time. Test it. Verify it. That's good. That's what I want you to do. Don't take my word for anything. I know I say sometimes, trust me. Trust me on this. It's just mechanical. 
All that is is a mechanical saying. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, don't trust me. Verify everything. This is not me. This is not James. Yes, I am teaching this according to what I know. But this system does not come from me. I didn't make this up. This is not mine. This is ancient. We always have to develop in the direction of our most inferior functions. The most unused side, the most despised side of ourselves. Not what we think is our best. Why? Well, because we have to become balanced. We're working toward being balanced man. Well, in order to be balanced man, you've got to stop working so hard with all the things you do best and start working with the things you don't do so well. The despised part of you, the part of you that you, oh, I can't do that. I mean, I can't do math. And so I have someone else do math. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do computer stuff. So I have someone else do that. Well, I'm very artistic, so I can do that. I can decorate. I can paint. I can do this and that. I can do music. But I can't do that other stuff. That's the other stuff that you need to do if you're going to become balanced. If you think well, if you're a good thinker, if you're intellectually strong, you need to feel more. If your feelings are sharp and accurate, you need to think more. If you feel too much, you got to think more. If you think too much, you've got to feel more. So, puppet, who's going to pull your strings? Life or this work? Here we are, puppets, all these dangling strings. Now, who is going to pull these strings? Are we going to have life continue to pull them? Or are we going to try and get in a position where the work can stand over us and begin to pull some of the strings so that maybe we can become better puppets? So that becoming better puppets, we will be able to get ourselves under the influence of of our fairy godmother and become real human beings. What man was meant to be. What is possible for us. And the choice is individually yours because it's not a choice that can be made collectively. So make it, then try and stick with it.